So good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to State Library. I'm Lorna Keast. I'm the Director of Community Connections here at State Library uh, of Queensland, and I'd like to welcome you all uh, to our place this evening and for our final Grattan Institute State of Affairs lecture for 2019. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay respect to their ancestors who came before them. The location of a state library um, on Kuripa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people and we proudly continue that tradition here today. I acknowledge and welcome our event partner Grattan Institute um, and I'd like to welcome our guest speakers who will be sharing their insights and expertise today. Um, Julie Sonneman, uh, Paul Kennard, um, Isabel Dagg, and Graham Maloney. Now, Grattan is a nonpartisan think tank uh, committed to championing high quality discussion to shape Australia's future. We've partnered with Grattan Institute for a number of years now, and I'm proud to see this collaboration continue with this lecture tonight. State Library is an inclusive and welcoming place for everyone, offering a safe and open public. Uh, discussion and debate, um, both online and on site. We want to inspire possibilities through knowledge, stories and creativity, um, and encourage robust and conversations and sharing of di diverse stories and opinions. This is the final Grattan State of Affairs lecture for 2019. Our first talk, talk was held in April. We saw an engaging panel discussion on the 2019 federal budget the next event in June featured a panel hosted by ABC's Scott Stevens, discussing the, rise, the rising housing costs and number of Queenslanders who are homeless. And if you miss these events, you can view the recordings of them at, on the State Library website. Tonight, our guest speakers will discuss what changes can be made to position a teaching career as an attractive option for young Australians. Uh, this event is all, also being live streamed on our website and you can join in on the conversation on Twitter using the handles um, here. Uh, I, I'll now, now like to hand over to Julie, uh, and we look forward to hearing your insights and expertise. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, my name's Julie. I'm a fellow in the School Education Program at the Grattan Institute. Um, and I wanted to welcome everyone here tonight to talk about this very important issue about how to attract more bright young people to teaching. Um, at the Grattan Institute, um, as mentioned, we're an independent, um, non-politically aligned think tank. Um, we can also choose what we want to write on. And we chose this topic um, because <laughs> we'd noticed a concerning trend in the data around who's applying to become teachers over the last, you know, this is not a short-term issue, this has been happening over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Mm. Um, and what you see is that actually there has been a decline in the number of bright young people choosing teaching. Um, and so tonight we're going to explore a little bit around why this might be happening and what can be done about it. So I'll be moderating the session. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel um, members in a little bit more detail. So Paul, um, immediately to my right here, is a senior experienced teacher in humanities um, at Brisbane State High School. He began there in 2003, and he is also, in the last four years, has become an instructional leader. He has a deep understanding of research-informed teaching and has a very strong um, approach to, partnership approach to coaching other teachers. Isabel is a young secondary English teacher. Young? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Relative to me, anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, you've worked in schools in rural Victoria and England, and Isabel's actually in the process of deciding whether to return to teaching at the moment, so this issue is very real and live for her and Graham Maloney, who is the General Secretary of the Queensland Teachers' Union, um, which represents over 44,000 teachers and principals across the state. Mm. Um, so I'll start by giving an outline of Grattan's recent report and some of the key findings, and then we'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll move to questions at the end for about 10, 15 minutes. So without further ado, I might give you a brief rundown on our latest report. So, as I mentioned, we've chosen this issue to look at because there have been um, some concerning trends in the data and, you know, it's, it's really important that we attract the right people to teaching. And obviously what makes an effective teacher is a number of different skills and traits and, and qualities. Um, 
higher order, higher order cognitive thinking skills is a key, a key, um, a key characteristic, along with high emotional intelligence, good leadership, good communication skills. When you look at the research about when you're recruiting people into teaching, what it tells you is that the best predictor of who is most likely to go on to be an effective teacher is actually around prior academic achievement. So how people went at school and how people went at university, there is a correlation with how well they do as a teacher later on. Obviously, it's not the, the only important skill and there's obviously a lot of other traits that go alongside that, um, but there is a link. And if you're to recruit, then this is one of the important things to look for. Um, and I think what's, what's happened in Australia is that we've gotten into this negative cycle where because fewer, you know, teaching isn't perceived as an attractive career option by high achievers, fewer people apply, and then because of the way that the university application system works, that means the ATAR then goes down, which then has a uh, more negative and compounding impact on the status of, of teaching. And what we'd really like to see happen is to really stimulate demand from all people in teaching, but particularly those who are high achievers, so that then you can select the best. You know, you can select people who do have great academic records and who do have that really high emotional intelligence and who do have all those other characteristics that we're talking about. And if you look at high-performing systems, they do have a lot more interest in teaching. So if you look at, say, Finland or Singapore, for example, we know that there's about 10 applications for every one position at university in teaching. So the situation is quite different. So what our report did was we surveyed around 1,000 bright young people across Australia who have an ATAR of 80 or above who, and asked them a little bit about their career decisions and what, what factors matter to them. And these people didn't choose teaching. Um, and by and large, the first, first and most important thing is making a difference. So young people are quite altruistic, um, having challenge, having work-life balance, you know, many of the things that you'd expect. What our survey also did was then compare, okay, so how, given you've said these things are important, you know, how does your chosen career fare on those things compared to what you think teaching might, might offer you in those areas? And when you ask the question in that way, you can often get a slightly deeper answer about perhaps some of the reasons they may not be able to articulate about why they've actually chosen their certain careers over another. And what really um, jumps out is that while making a difference is one of the most um, important factors to young people, they thought that actually they could get that in their chosen career, not just teaching. Um, and the two areas where teaching fell short the most were around um, intellectual challenge and high earnings. So the intellectual challenge was a really interesting one because um, it wasn't that, that people thought that teaching would be easy, so they did acknowledge that it was a tough and a difficult choice, but just that there was a, a worry about getting stuck in the one classroom that there wasn't necessarily a clear career path compared to some of their other career options that they were looking at. And that ability to move forward and to progress was something that sort of came out in the comments. Um, and the second was around um, earnings, which was interesting because when you ask people, how do you make your career choices, that doesn't necessarily come out as the number one thing, but this is actually where the biggest gap was. And they are onto something because if you look at what high achievers can earn in other professions, um, teaching really does fall short. It's quite competitive in, well, relatively competitive in, you know, your 20s as a teacher compared to your university peers. But as you get into your 30s and 40s, the gaps really open up. And this is not just about in comparison to people doing medicine or law. This is also just in terms of average, and your average typical student, who, bachelor student who's gone to university the average teacher salary um, for those who were at the top of their um, professions, the gap is huge. And it wasn't always this way. So if we look back to the 80s, salaries and teachings were, were on par with other professions and it's, it's since then that there's, big, there's been big changes. So our report recommends governments do three things. Um, the first is that our survey showed that just some short-term financial incentives for young people were, were really attractive and actually this is a very cost-effective reform. I think people often value money now more than later, so to, 
to some degree, especially students, so it makes quite a lot of sense. So $10,000 scholarships was a really obvious thing that governments can do for anyone who has an ATAR above 80, obviously with other screening on the other desirable traits that you'd also want for these people. Um, and we're talking about, you know, doing this at scale, so 16,000 across Australia. Um, the second is around better career pathways. So going to that idea about challenge that came through in the survey, how can you give people that opportunity to move forward? Um, and so we're recommending two new roles, an instructional specialist, which will be paid around $40,000 more than your standard classroom teacher today, which is about 140,000, and also a master teacher role, which is working across schools, um, and that they're equivalent to someone who might be working in a region, and they would be um, the professionals in their specialty area, so in their subject area or their specific niche. Um, and they would be having, you know, pay rises of around 180,000. And these roles aren't um, for everyone. We're recommending that it would only be for five to eight percent of the workforce for the instructional specialists in schools, and only the very top echelon of less than one percent at a master teacher level would receive that. Um, and partly that's for two reasons. One is around, you know, the need for these roles and what jobs they're doing, and we believe that it should be driven by the job. Um, and also around cost. If government is to implement this, then this needs to be feasible. And the last is around a marketing campaign. So promoting, you know, some of the changes that we're suggesting, but also a little bit of raising awareness about what teaching actually involves. I think what it's shown here is that, you know, teaching, that perception that teaching isn't necessarily intellectually challenged, I think does need to be, you know, overturned. Um, so, they're the findings of our report, but um, I'll stop talking, talking now and hand over to our um, panel to discuss some of these issues. So, Paul, I might start with you. Um, as, a, um, as someone who is in an instructional coach role, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what you think are the opportunities for a, a career pathway for someone who is interested in really mastering teaching, like yourself? Um, and teaching others and, you know, do you think that there is a need for more opportunities in this space? Um, so my role as a pedagogy coach has been developed over the last five years at the school that I work at, at Brisbane State High School. It was an opportunity that I was invited to take part in and it was a fantastic opportunity. So it was for me who was not really interested in um, taking an admin path, mm. a really uh, good opportunity to stay in the classroom and get a leadership role, so, yeah. And can I ask, in terms of um, this role, is this something that, can you tell us a little bit more about how it, was, how it came about, like with, whether it was on uh, something that was really obvious to you as a teacher when you first started? It didn't exist when I first started. So uh, th to think that I would end up as a pedagogy coach uh, was not part of my uh, approach towards teaching when I was a young teacher. Um, merely surviving in the classroom was my approach towards teaching <laughs> in the classroom, <laughs> I think. Uh, when So I did seven years country service up in Tully. Basically, uh, I did my undergraduate, did a postgraduate, undergraduate, uh, did a postgraduate, and then did a diploma in education, and then did my country service. Uh, those seven years were basically where I learned how to teach. Then we moved back here, and I was uh, posted to Brisbane State High School, which was just another world. So the learning curve there again was was quite high. Um, I had other leadership roles within the school. Um, but when I was asked to take this position, it was pretty brand new and it was a concept that was, well, it was brand new, so, and I was fortunate enough to take it. Fortunate and in terms of this type of career path where it's about becoming a coach of other teachers, is it clear what the next step is for you? If after you don't this. necessarily want to go into school principalship, yeah, after this? Uh, no. Um, the next step, which I've, I've taken, so pedagogy coach for, for the last five years, uh, that has been a huge learning as well. Uh, we've moved from a cognitive coaching approach to now a more instructional 
uh, coaching approach, learning the skills that were needed to engage teachers, professional teachers, um, with experience at a partnership level was quite a complex development. Uh, and that's been, that was a, a great challenge and very, very um, rewarding. For me, the coaching space is really, really powerful. Uh, and it's something to develop further. What I have done next, the next natural step for me as a career pathway was to take advantage of the new um, HALT positions, the highly accomplished and the lead teaching positions. Uh, and I have completed my application for a highly accomplished teacher, which I actually have become one today. So <laughs> 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 um, that was an extraordinarily difficult and stressful process. It was really, really hard. It's one of the hardest things I've done besides becoming a teacher. Um, so I, that was the next step. After that, well, I'll just see what that opens up, I suspect. Can you tell us a little bit more about something that came out in the surveys was just, you know, young people were attracted to the idea of having support, you know, opportunities to develop in, and get better as a teacher. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do in your role to coach others? Uh, the coaching space is... Uh, the, how we use it at State High, it's, it's a voluntary um, aspect. So the teachers will uh, think okay, I want to approach the coach and I want to talk about what I want to achieve in the classroom. Uh, in this space, the coach and the coachee would sit down and we'd have a conversation about what was on their mind, what did they want to achieve, uh, what were the outcomes they were looking for. And it would be a partnership. But we would go backwards and forwards. A lot of the listening would be on my part. I'd be asking them uh, open-ended questions to get them to reflect upon their practice. What is it that they want to develop? What pedagogy skill do they want to incorporate into their classroom practice? And what are those student outcomes that they're looking for? This is a cyclic process. So the initial conversation would be identifying the actual pedagogy that they would like to work on. The coachee would go away. They would uh, work on it in the classroom. The conversation would occur again two to three weeks later. How did it go? What worked well? What would you like to change? Um, what are your next step? And so on and so forth until the teacher is happy with that particular pedagogy. It's working well with them. The student outcomes have improved and then we might move on to a new pedagogy. Sometimes this would involve the uh, videoing of the mm -hmm. teacher's practice in the classroom which is extraordinarily powerful, extraordinarily confronting as well. But the conversation would then be again around getting the coachee to reflect upon their practice. So it's not so much as me telling them what they need to do, it's me being used as a sounding board to reflect upon <coughs> what they're looking at, what they want to achieve and where to go to next. Julie, can I, uh, anybody who knows me and there's a few in this room know I wreck scripts um, <laughs> and, and timing. So, Paul, for your coaching role, do uh, you get some time for that? And yes. And, and some paid, you paid the same as a HOD? Or no, now I am, but that's yeah. because I'm a, um, a highly Probably accomplished. Yeah. No, 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 the, the, the way that was approached um, was I was given two lines teaching or point four teaching and um, point 0.6 or three lines off yeah. to, to work with other teachers. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got the time. Now if you're a, a, a highly accomplished teacher, you'll get paid 111000 just so that you can put it all in context of the numbers we're talking about. It's going from 101000 to 111, and the first level that you're talking about is 140. Yeah. That's right. So... That's yeah, right. That's, so, yeah. that's all the wrecking on Yeah, no, Sorry. that's right. So, <laughs> as, a, as an ex experienced senior teacher, I'm on 101. With the, I thought it was 117 for the HALT, but if it's 100, 111 for the HALT. <laughs> <Is> <laughs> <it>? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, should have gone the lead. I should have gone the lead. Oh, man, have you seen him trying to do lead? Anyway. Um, and then in 2022, I think there's going to be a new stage for um, experienced senior teacher where that will increase yep. to 110. Yep. So, you know, I could have waited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But there, yeah, so yeah. yeah, that's how it that's how it, it's working at the moment. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, and it's a really good point to to go straight to the salary because there is, you know, salary is what it is, but it, there is something there about valuing expertise yes. and what people are bringing and who master teaching. Yeah. Um, Isabel, I might jump to you. So, Paul, yeah. that was a really great um, overview of the type of support, professional support that you provide. So, Isabel, maybe if you could talk a little bit about your experience as a graduate teacher and the professional support that you received um, and, you know, how that might differ to your, the experience of other teachers. Yeah, absolutely. So I started teaching in rural Victoria as an English teacher um, and my gateway into teaching was a program called Teach for Australia. And what that meant for me is that in my first two years of teaching, I actually had three mentors. Um, I had an in-school mentor um, that the school provided who was an accomplished teacher. I had a university mentor um, who was mentoring me as I was studying alongside my teaching and a Teach for Australia mentor um, who had a lot of conversations similar to ones you've just described about picking a focus, coming into classrooms, perhaps um, videoing and having a very um, equal conversation about how we could so solve the problems that were coming up in the classroom together or how we could affect the change that we wanted in the classrooms together. So for the first two years of my teaching, I had someone coming into my classrooms pretty much every fortnight, which is a really high level of support. Um, and I, I really valued that. It helped me to become a better teacher. It helped me to survive, you know, <laughs> my first years of teaching. But all of that considered... Um, I still found teaching really, really hard um, and actually ended up leaving the classroom after my first three years. Um, so I stayed an extra year on after the program um, at the same school in rural Victoria. And with all of the coaching that I got, I felt like I was improving as a teacher, definitely. But where for me personally, my experiences at school started to fall down a little was, was a little bit more at a a kind of a, a school-wide um, level. I felt like sometimes I still was operating as an island and I was working really hard to affect change in my classroom, but the systems at the school, um, the, the kind of space and... Um, and, yeah, the space for people to move into roles of leadership to support teachers wasn't necessarily there. So... It's a role similar to yours sounds like something that we would have just loved because I would have loved to be having conversations not only how to be a new teacher but how to be a good teacher with all of my peers and that's what I felt like I really missed um, and I, I you know I think it's a collaborative effort teaching I think that you know absolutely and um, and that's where I have since actually gone back into the classroom in various places and some of my most positive experiences have come from where I've got peers who have space to engage professionally, who have support from mentors or coaches and that the school is providing that space, uh, that priority, whether it's time allocation, remuneration, however it's done. That support has definitely been integral to all of my very positive experiences of teaching. Mm. Mm. Graeme, can I move over to you? So in terms of the Queensland Teachers Union's sort of view about, you know, having a, um, jobs for really great teachers to coach and mentor others and help improve teaching practice, um, yeah, what are your views? Um, what are your views on the Grattan model? Uh, strongly support them. Um, I think uh, the, ev the evidence about higher salaries and better career paths is there. Uh, we've seen it historically uh, at times when we've had significant improvements in salary. You actually see a spike in the entrance uh, applications the following year uh, and the level of them as well. Uh, and that's over the space of about 30 years. And I think it's um, you've reiterated a point that's been made for almost 30 years 
which is um, teaching salaries start relatively high compared to other professions, but they drop off relatively quickly. And it's that longer term attraction uh, that's the important thing uh, in, in the entire mix. People see it'll be okay for a few years, but, but not beyond that. Um, I also very much agree with your report, and I know it's been misrepresented in a couple of places, um, that ATAR isn't everything. You've got to be the right person to be able to do it. ATAR is only, only part of that. But the notion of getting people who are better ac academically qualified into teaching is something you can't really argue with. Uh, there is a correlation. The, I, I took notes because otherwise I'll go on forever. Uh, <laughs> and that, that really does wreck the script. So this is discipline, um, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, I was a bit surprised about the the result about lack of career challenge, people not choosing teaching because of a lack of career challenge. And I think they really need to try it um, <laughs> to, to see if there's any intellectual challenge there because I think it is intellectually enormously challenging. I think the question is whether or not you get the rewards commensurate with the challenges uh, that go with it. Uh, I did have a friend who I started teaching with who resigned after five years because she told the same joke on the same day in the same economics class uh, and thought, hell, I can't keep on doing this for the next uh, 30 years. Um, that's true, but in a variety of classes, variety of locations, um, there are a, just the different children who turn up each year, because we haven't standardised the kiddies yet. Um, all of that makes a challenge the job really intellectually challenging. Coaching and mentoring, I don't think there's a better way to invest um, money in terms of improving teaching quality uh, in the system, especially with newly qualified teachers. Uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear about all that. Uh, I break ranks a little bit when we come to talk about um, positions of instructional specialist or master teacher, because I think we need to rethink the way we look at positions in a teaching career pathway. Uh, if those positions are just another promotional position in a tailorist hierarchy, uh, it won't work. It just, if, if they're jobs that are going to be doing things to people, and Paul emphasised the importance of the person who's being coached coming to him and that being a real dialogue. Um, you emphasised uh, very much the importance of mentoring uh, in that space. But if it's something that's directed down by a person in authority mm -hmm. who is going to do something to you, then it, then it will fail. It's not worth the effort. So we, we constantly think in terms of those bureaucratic bureaucratic um, models, tree diagrams. Uh, we need to break that thinking uh, if we're to do something like that. Uh, we've been involved in, in working on, you're gonna ask me about the quotas, aren't you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we, we tend to stray away from the notion of the quotas, the five to eight percent uh, and the 0.5 percent. We've been working on the highly accomplished and lead teachers on the basis that that standards space to provides an incentive to everybody um, to improve their skills and go through that process. I agree with Paul absolutely, it's overblown uh, at the moment uh, because I think we tend to do that in education the first time we do something. We over-engineer it to hell uh, and it's more uh, rigorous than it needs to be. We we have a an accuracy of 0.00001% when 1% would be fine uh, for the purposes of the exercise. Uh, and we've had that experience about quotas um, way back uh, with AST, the Advanced Skills Teacher, back in the early 1990s. Now, when that was first introduced, 
there was a quota applied by the Industrial Relations Commission to constrain costs uh, for precisely that reason. Uh, the net effect was that we, had, we ran into a whole series of problems. One was, where are you going to put them? Are they based on the number of teachers in the schools? Are they based on the number of eligible teachers in the schools? What if you've got no eligible teachers in the schools? Uh, all those sorts of things. So the first one was placement. Then they said 80% of the positions are going to be in school. So only teachers within the school are eligible to apply for them, which again creates an issue because some places like State High, for instance, would be heavy with experienced teachers. Other places like Tully High would not have a hell of a lot of experienced teachers. Uh, and then the remaining quarter was up for open grabs across the state. Uh, and we're talking in that case that was around about uh, 2,000 positions in a competitive process with about 30, up, you know, up to 30,000 people being able to apply for them. Um, it's a fascinating exercise, but you're better off spending the money on paying the teachers more than on going through the selection process associated with it. So around highly accomplished and lead teacher, what we've looked at is something that's standards based, you meet the standard, um, you get there, no, no matter where you are, it's an incentive for people to continue to develop. But the numbers that we've got are not high enough, 111 for a highly accomplished teacher is not enough, 121 for a lead teacher is not enough. Ironically, if you go back to the numbers that someone like Lauren Ingverson and Elizabeth Kleinhens were talking about 10 years ago, uh, they would have said a highly accomplished teacher should be paid around about $140,000 and a, um, an elite teacher would have been about $175,000 yeah, right. in today's money. Yeah. So there you go. I think you've got the price point. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, no, I think it's a really interesting perspective. I think to give context for, um, I think for Grattan's model, so in terms of the 5 to 8%, we're seeing that as a rough estimate of the demand for these, these roles. And I think where we differ is that we think that the positions should be driven by the demand and need for them in the school. Mm. And that it would link with the certification process, which we see as a step forward in, in recognising capabilities, um, but that that would be a prerequisite, but then it would come down to a, a selection process. Um, and I think ultimately what we'd like to see happen is that this is about changing a role in a school so that it's actually someone's day, dedicated day job to coach and, and um, develop others um, as opposed to necessarily just having a, a sort of a piece of paper that that might, you know, be certification but doesn't actually change your day job. Mm. And that can be sometimes at the discretion of a school principal, which may or may not happen. Mm. Um, so just quickly now moving to pay. So we've suggested $40,000 more for an instructional specialist in a school, which is mm. relatively achievable um, if you're an ambitious, great teacher, which, Isabel, no doubt you are. Um, just interested in your quick reactions on... You know, how does money's not everything, but how does that factor into your decision making at this point in terms of thinking about whether you go back to teaching? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, of course, money's not everything, but I'm at the point in my life where I'm thinking really seriously about my financial goals and what's a viable financial goal. Will I be able to, you know, buy a house? Do I want to have children? If I do, what kind of lifestyle do I want? You know, so they're very real considerations. Um, I think, the, yeah, the concept of pay as well is ties into um, uh, how teaching is seen as a profession. And uh, you know, even today I was reflecting on an anecdote of one of my very good friends um, when we were in high school and she was, you know, she's a high achiever herself and she was like, I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to have two holiday homes. And of course, not for a minute am I saying having two holiday homes is, is going to lead to a happier, successful life. But in that classroom, there was no conversation around I'm going to be a teacher and I'm going to have two holiday homes. Mm. So, you know, like, <laughs> even like at a practical level, it's very attractive to me to be able to, to think about the kind of lifestyle I would want. But on a broader, broader kind of um, level, w what kind of 
architecture of teaching, what kind of people do we want in these classrooms, I think that pay is a lever that can be looked at, definitely. Yeah, and it might actually just help you buy a first home. Well, as to yeah, home. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think yeah. she's looking at two holiday homes anymore. <laughs> as a pipe dream. Yeah. Um, Paul, what are your reactions? Uh, it would be nice, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I, th I think so. It's Look, I, the role of... My role as a coach in the classroom... Um, uh, sorry, my role as a coach and working with other teachers has the flow-down effect of impacting on students in the classroom. That is, that's... That's the end game. If you're a teacher, you, you are there to educate and you are there to improve the outcomes of, of students. Sometimes the monetary aspect doesn't come into consideration. Uh, most of the good teachers that I know are not going up the admin path because they don't want to. They want to be in the classroom. That's where they're making the most change. To have these new structures into place, to have the, the, um, the highly accomplished and the lead, I think will encourage not as they stand at the moment, but I think eventually they will encourage more teachers to stay in the classroom. That extra um, numeration will be an encouragement, a further encouragement for that, yeah. Mm. And now we might move to uh, the issue of teacher workload, which is obviously um, something, if you know any teachers at all, you know is a big issue. Um, for their working lives. Um, this wasn't something that came out strongly in our report about necessarily a way to attract more high achievers because for whatever reason, high achievers were very quick to trade off um, work, uh, family work-life balance in our survey. Um, but no doubt it might be something that they might care about a bit more when they actually join teaching and realise some of the challenges. So Graeme, I just thought to quickly throw to you, you know, obviously you've done a lot of work in this space. What do you see as the key issues in this area? Excessive workload is one of the key issues in retention of people. It's not necessarily in, in terms of attraction, although it can be um, an issue for people when they're sitting and looking at their choices and they look and, and make comparisons. So it might be the holiday homes. It might be, uh, it might be being able to use the holiday homes mm. uh, or to have a holiday in, in that space. This feeds in, in a couple of ways, I think. Uh, we ran a survey of our members, which we do every four years, big scale survey. Uh, not a high turnout, but enough to, to get a good, um, or a, a reasonable result that we could rely on. For the first time in the six or seven series of this survey, uh, workload was the number one issue uh, and more than 50% of the people in the survey rated excessive workload as the first or second most important issue for them as a teacher uh, and closely linked to them contemplating whether or not they're going to stay or leave the profession. Uh, so that for us is really significant. It is... It, was second last time having come from nowhere, but the jump this time was really incredibly significant uh, and it's become a very important part of the work, uh, our work over the next two years at least, but it will take longer than that um, to corral it all. I think where some of this comes in goes to what Isabel was saying about the capacity to collaborate with people. Um, and the attractiveness of teaching as a profession, because again, I think all the research is telling us that collaboration and collegiality are key. The evidence is showing us that people don't have time for that because of the workload associated with teaching. Yeah. So that, that removes a, a layer of satisfaction with it. And to the extent that people can see that from outside, um, that's a, a, a negative att attractor. Yeah. Uh, mm. if, if it's just going to be a matter of filling in forms, accumulating data that nobody ever reads, uh, doing all those sorts of things, as opposed to the moral purpose that attaches to being a teacher, you know, wanting to make a difference for these children, then yeah. that's a big factor. Can I ask, 
um, so what were some of the driving factors of the workload? So you were saying collecting data unnecessarily or what, were uh, the, what are some of the themes that come back in your surveys? The, sorry, the best work that's been done around this has been done in the UK um, over the space of the last three or four years where they've had a workload challenge. Uh, the top three in that space were uh, preparation, the amount of work associated with preparation, the amount of work associated with marking, and the third one was the amount of work associated with data collection. And the workload survey that QDU conducted in 2018 um, showed up the same sorts of issues. Yes. Paul or Isabel, can you share any insights into ways that you think teacher workload could be reduced or um, there's any sort of tasks that you think, you know, could be dropped to make teachers' working lives easier? Uh, there's always things that can be dropped, I think. <laughs> um, teachers need a lot of time to think, I think. Uh, and it, it, it's in that thinking process that they, they develop their lesson plans, uh, that they consider what they want to achieve, that they can produce the work that they need to in order to make uh, whatever they're teaching successful. Giving more time to teachers to have that professional courtesy to uh, ponder and think mm -hmm. about what they want to achieve, I think is an area that could be expanded. Uh, and so having said that, you'd have to take away some other stuff, whatever those schools are doing, uh, that perhaps isn't immediately relevant to the teachers at that particular time would be something to take into consideration. Mm. I'll just add quickly, I'm, I'm not particularly surprised that the report had those numbers that, you know, a trade-off for lifestyle um, wasn't something that was too worrying. A lot of high achievers, speaking anecdotally, um, that, you know, some of my very good friends, they're not afraid to work hard. The long hours don't phase them. They really want, they're proud of their work and they want to do their work. But what I would probably say is that the underlying um, idea there is that the work ultimately is sustainable, uh, it's meaningful, and that it will lead to change. And I think when teachers are getting caught maybe doing work and putting in hours where they're not necessarily in a habit that's sustainable or that their work is fundamentally leading to change, um, that's where teachers can get really, really up, you know, it can be very frustrating. Mm. That's a really good point. Mm. Um, and lastly, I might turn to our, um, the final recommendation about a marketing campaign. Um, and we're, re we're suggesting a $25 million sort of campaign. I think the Australian Defence Force spends about $40 million a year for some of those great Defence Force ads that I think everybody has seen. Um, uh, but, you know, it's a lot to spend on a marketing campaign. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, $25 million is 250 teachers. In Queensland, the, the Queensland share would be about 50. Uh, so always balk a little bit about that. But on the other hand, I keep on telling people uh, and within my own organisation, if you're doing a great job and nobody hears about it, then did anything happen at all? Did you do anything at all? So I think it's necessary. We need to change the culture about what teaching is, full stop. I mean, uh, I have these OP, well, I won't anymore, but I have been having OP conversations with students. And you're always asking the question, well, you know, what, what do you want to do when you leave school? And it's always medicine, it's always engineering, it's always law, blah, blah, blah. Um, do you want to be a teacher? Oh, no. Why not? Oh, no. Just don't want it. Too hard, too difficult. And there's this real misconception about what actually teaching is. So I think to change the culture and the understanding, teaching is an extraordinarily honourable job in, in a society that has many, many jobs. Uh, uh, the rewards are fantastic. I just don't think people recognise that. So if you can do that, that'd be great. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll echo what you say. And even comments from the report, I don't want to get stuck in a classroom. Not only what teaching is, but what other 
you know, options you can have, a, like a role like yourself, something like that, where you're in the classroom, but you're also teaching and learning with adults in a really meaningful way. I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, yeah. Along those lines. Um, getting stuck in the classroom, I do not understand that, seriously. Mm. There is no such thing as getting stuck in a classroom. It changed, mm. like um, Graham was saying before, it changes continuously. I started off as an ancient history teacher. Uh, I now teach modern history. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on the pilot and the um, scheme for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders mm. syllabus, so working with Uncle Lenny Grant up north, uh, became heavily involved in that. There, you, there is no set path in teaching. And you will learn continuously yeah. all along the way. And they're the types of things young high achievers need to hear if we're going to yeah. get, get those numbers. Yeah. 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 Great, okay. Um, we might throw open to any questions from the audience at this point. Um, I think we have microphones roving. Thanks, just this gentleman here in the red. Uh, Gary Collins is my name. I'm re now retired, but I worked for the State Department here in Queensland for 35 years as a high school English teacher, mainly as a department head. Uh, my question uh, relates to the workload issue. And I'd like to put a proposition and ask all members of the panel to respond to it. And the proposition is that at the high school level in this country, we really don't organise teachers' work in the most sensible manner. I suggest that we routinely ask teachers to juggle too many balls at the one time. And let me just flesh that out. Uh, in 1997, I was the head of English at a state suburban high school here in Brisbane and I had an exchange to a school in Toronto and Canada. Both schools were roughly the same size, worked a four period day, a 20 period week. At my school here in Brisbane, staff teachers on a full load uh, had five or six classes and generally they saw those classes three times a week. As a department head on a reduced face-to-face -face, uh, teaching load, I had three classes. In the Canadian school, employed as a staff teacher, on a full load, I had three classes. Because you see, that was what the, can the local Canadians called a semester school. Four period day, but kids only did at any one time as many subjects as the were periods in the day, four. Those classes met every day. So I taught six classes over the year, but only three in each semester. A much more man manageable proposition. And yet when I tried to put this to people when I came home, they just looked at me blankly and said, that's not the way we do business here, Gary. You know, <laughs> Have you been away, by the way? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> that's the proposition we, we don't uh, utilise the most expensive resource involved in schools in the most sensible manner. We could do a better job with that and make teachers' life more manageable and they, they, and they could then take more advantage of the intellectual challenges which are certainly there and have more intellectually satisfying work. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Any, any comments? I think there's lots of lots of different ways that we could organise things. Um, my first years of teaching, I spent a lot of time team teaching uh, with the head of department, mm. uh, me as a first year teacher and, the, and a second year teacher. Um, and we divided up the work. It was a year eight class, three classes. One person was doing the prep for the particular set of classes, the workload around marking and all that sort of stuff was shared. Uh, all those sorts of possibilities, instead of three people doing three lots of everything, looking remarkably similar, uh, the workload was, was shared around. And I got to learn from the head of department, who was really well qualified, and particularly around the things which matter really a lot to uh, newly qualified teachers, things like classroom management and behaviour management. Mm. Absolutely, reducing the workload 
um, of teachers. We give them more opportunity to plan for better lessons, for better outcomes. Sounds no. like a sensical approach, but team teaching is is pretty powerful as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, I've done a little bit of work in the East Asian systems, and they very much make a very explicit trade-off, particularly in Shanghai, about yes. teachers have roughly about half the amount of teaching classes that we do in Australia, and in the other half of the time, they have time to prepare for their pla um, their lessons, do their marking, co um, collaborate, yeah. and it's a very different system as a result um, but having said that the way that they afford that is because that they have larger class sizes mm. um, so it does I think these are really interest, you know valid conversations and I think it's you get into a space of well, what what how can we restructure things so that it is affordable for our government and it is also good for teachers I mean, some of the issues that we've been looking at at Grattan is um, just some of the efficiencies potentially around sort of um, lesson planning and curriculum design. At the, you know, there's very much been a, a trend towards school autonomy and teachers collating their own materials and putting those things together, which I think is extremely valuable. But every now and again, you'll come across a school that will say, oh, we've invested all of this, you know, time and effort into constructing and, and reorganising this particular module ourselves. And you sort of think... I'm sure that's useful, but what's the trade-off there? And, you know, are there, is there more support that could be offered to schools and to individual teachers so that they're not necessarily caught in this cycle of having to create everything themselves and starting from scratch? You mentioned school autonomy. Often what is missing is autonomy for individual teachers. Uh, too often uh, my observation would be that individual teachers don't get much opportunity to make decisions for themselves because the work program says this and the syllabus says that and it's nailed down too much. We have uh, PLCs at our school and they're run by teachers and those What's teach PLC? our professional learning communities. communities. And within that system, they, they have the autonomy to identify a smart goal that they would like to achieve in their particular area. And this is teacher driven. That's their autonomy. The new suite of English syllabuses in this state doesn't even trust uh, schools to select texts anymore, yeah. which we happily managed for 40 years. But uh, yeah. you need to Gary, I think there's a few other people. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Sorry. Yes. And I'm sure they noticed when you went and when you came back. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, next question, that'd be great. Thank you much to the man up there in the shirt. Yep. Very good question, um, because that's one of the things that I thought of when I was thinking about this, because if you do this on a quota, then you can allocate positions into rural and remote schools that are only accessible to people who are prepared to go there. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the best way to do it, but that's certainly something that could happen in that space. Uh, but the way in which in Queensland we've tried to do that is uh, something that is a retention scheme, uh, which is based on, it's called an incentive scheme, but it is in fact a retention scheme. Uh, it's based on people who are serving in those communities uh, staying beyond the minimum period of time uh, and being able to um, receive additional benefits, remuneration, travel, all those sorts of things um, to be able to do it. Uh, is there enough invested in that? No. Does it have some impact on the turnover? Yes, but probably not as much as we'd like. Mm. Can I add just a really quick note, just from my own personal experience of teaching rurally um, for three years, one one of the main things that I loved about it um, were the peers that I had around me. And I had some really great peers um, within 
an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and we put a very, uh, you know, we, we intentionally cultivate a community and they were something that um, was hugely important to me professionally and personally. The other thing, though I ultimately left a rural community, now looking at housing markets and things like that, I'm thinking, I didn't have it too bad out there. Maybe there's some more professional communities doing interesting things. You know, I'll go for a hike on the weekend, have my own garden. So there, there are lifestyle factors there that I think so, some inner city, um, people who are living in the inner city, like me at the moment, are thinking maybe I could, could get them easily in a rural, or more, a little more easily in a rural or a remote community. Great. Um, next question. Sorry to the man down here in the front. Uh, I recommend the topic is to attract more teachers and we focus more on the younger generations. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher 10 years ago. It's a third world country and it's different. Yeah. We teach 70 kids in one classroom for yeah. eight, mm -hmm. eight hours paid job, but you work 12 hours and hours. Mm -hmm. So what my case is, I came here because of my education and my wife was a student and I'm a teacher back overseas, and then I tried to be a teacher in the first two years. So I sent my papers to the college Clinton teachers, so yep. I got the result assessment, and it says your degree and your experience is as a bachelor degree in Australia. So I'm qualified as a bachelor degree, a secondary school teacher. And then I cannot get to be a teacher because they want me to pass IELTS, yeah. which involves speaking, listening, yeah. reading, and what's the other one? Writing. Writing. Yeah. So I think I took four times or five times. I can get 7.5 on the three, so I cannot still qualify because the other one is seven. The next one, the next exam is different <coughs> aspect, different area, I get seven. So I said, so I get hopeless, so I stop. But if you want to attract more teachers, there are a lot of immigrants that here that are really good in a special, specific area in teaching. But they cannot just pass the IELTS. But they have the assessment from the college, uh, college, college that, that's, yeah. that they are qualified as a teacher and their degree is qualified as bachelor degree in Australia. That's my case. Hmm. You can attract them. They are mature. They're not young. But they have still have at least maximum 10, 20 years they can teach and they can impact the younger generation in school. And other things is, I remember as a teacher is, do we teach to live or we live to teach? Hmm. And if we will go back to the traditional absolute truth, I'm a Christian, okay? It says, if you are a teacher, you have more responsibility and you will be judged more. Mm. That's a heavy responsibility. That's why it's us. It's in my case. Mm. I still want to be a teacher, but that's what I said. Hopefully, they're gonna, because I also meet this person, the founder of another English test in Mount Grabat, Graham, John Graham, and he told me that IELTS was made they are one of the proponents of IELTS before. It's only made for the coming student in Australia. Mm. Not for the professional already from third world country to come to Australia, mm. but they include everyone. And now people like me, it's hopeless to get. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you can still attract more, more teachers for the immigrants that I just had. I met, I'm studying TA now as a teacher aide. Mm. And I met a couple of there. They were teachers before. In that back in the country, science, math, which is, they say it's hard, it's not, you will study. <laughs> so they are teachers, but they are just TA in a certain high school. Yeah. I'm, mm. a, I'm studying at TA. Mm. So you can still attract more mature immigrants mm. that's already here. They yeah. are willing to teach because for the third world country people like us, if you have the degree, you have someone, something inside of you. And it's not about money in our country. Right. It's we are, we can have, we can be the kids last for us. And we can try to support the kids if they fail. Right. That's what teachers are. Right. So you can still uh, attract other immigrants. Okay. So, thank you.
so at the, at the start, we sort of jumped over the, the issue of, of scholarships uh, as an attraction of, of people in. And I think that's a really good idea. Uh, I, come, I came into teaching just after scholarships went out, the old bonded scholarships uh, in Queensland, when, uh, I mean, those scholarships were a mechanism for smart working class kids um, to be able to get into a, a profession that they couldn't in the, in the days before free university. Uh, I think in the days of HEX, I think scholarships are a good way to attract uh, high achieving, at least at that school level, in there. But I don't think that that's the only use of scholarships. I think this sort of case where you've got a qualified person needs intensive English is another great way for governments to use scholarships to, um, to get people in. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, um, particularly because I'm really conscious at the moment. I went to uh, an international conference in Thailand a couple of months ago. We are the most appallingly monolingual country in the <laughs> world. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Yeah. Um, so any, anything that gets people with more languages yeah. teaching is a good thing. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Great. Maybe um, a question from the woman here in the white. Thanks. Thank you. I'm um, Emily Simons. I work at State High with Paul and if I could pay him that extra 40000 <laughs> <laughs> I would because the work that he does with teachers is really, it, it is incredible and I know that we're very lucky to have him. I guess my question is probably more to Julie and Graham because um, I guess when we talk about attracting teachers, I'm thinking about also attracting great leaders into our system so that we can have... I guess those people that can create the spaces to do what um, Paul and Isabel have sort of described in terms of spaces for collaboration and coaching and to think a bit differently um, because I think that's also, uh, you know, it's not for everyone. Um, as, as Paul said, it's not for everyone, but we also want to attract great leaders in schools because yes. we also know that having that great leadership in schools and in systems is what generates... I guess, ability to be able to, you know, push the agenda around um, what's happening in schools for teachers and for kids. So I'm interested in how that perhaps plays into some of that research or, and the yeah. thinking behind that. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, our research looked mainly at um, high achievers, so we didn't um, test or look at people who have that sort of leadership potential, um, but I think it's a fascinating piece of research to do. Um, yeah, I, I probably don't have more to offer on that issue than that. Graeme, do you have any other comments? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, millions. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think something like this um, sets up a, a dynamic and a tension uh, in that space. So creating, creating more highly paid teaching positions offers a pathway for people who want to stay largely involved in the classroom rather than going into those other roles. Uh, does that create an issue around uh, people going into leadership? I think it does. Because the minute you attach, people can get equivalent money over here, then I think you find fewer people going into that, that promotional pathway. So I think there's some important work to be done there because school leadership is critical in being able to run good schools as well. Now, if we talk about it in, in comparison, comparative dollar terms, uh, we've just finished an enterprise bargaining agreement. We paid particular attention to um, salaries of principals, but we ran into a, a cap. So Paul's principal, and your principal, uh, at the end of the agreement is going to get paid to $212,000, which sounds like a hell of a lot of money, but not when you consider that state high there's 3,200 students, um, there's a staff, a teaching staff of 250, um, overall staff of more than 300. Um, 
211,000 is not enough. <laughs> I, I, it was on my back to get him a $50,000 pay rise. I don't think it quite succeeded <laughs> in that one. So, but, but in answer to the question, both are essential. Uh, it, it's, it's recognition of either. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I use um, the analogy the same as I, I do with teachers. A good, a good principal should not have to go into um, a bureaucracy position in the Department of Education, sorry, um, a bureaucracy position in the, in the Department of Education uh, to achieve the higher levels of pay. Um, same sort of principle, yeah. Ellie. <laughs> and I think sort of just... Anecdotally, it seems like the the principal role itself also needs to be examined. I think as well as the support and the pay, um, a lot of is, is expected of principals under this, um, you know, more devolution of schools and autonomy. And you know, in some states, they have introduced business managers, for example, to help try and share the load. Um, but I do think there potentially scope for some of those functions to be done by others potentially, so that principals can concentrate on a narrower, you know, and deeper set of tasks. Um, for example, some of the, you know, instructional leadership that you've obviously delegated out to Paul in the school is great. You know, I think sometimes there's a tendency for principals and to hold that very closely within their sort of, um, you know, close senior executive teams. In 35 years, I never saw a principal do anything that could realistically be called instructional leadership. <laughs> and I don't think that's an unusual experience. All right. Um, thank you. Perhaps the man up the back there in the jumper. Um, I don't think anyone in the room would doubt that paying teachers more would fix a number of the systemic issues. Like the, the graph tells us everything there. Mm. But Graham, you just come out of an EB uh, yep. conversation with government. There is no appetite for this, as far as I can tell. Because if there was, you would be announcing the new pay at. <laughs> the, at, the recommended at, rate that Grattan would have come at, up with. At so high levels, yes. So can you, I suppose, give us an insight as to what your counterpart on the other side is saying about teacher salaries? <laughs> yes. Um, now, let, let, let me just be sort of... <laughs> reasonably careful about this. No. I, it's closed Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think the fundamental problem is uh, for the bulk of government, uh, education is still seen as a cost rather than an investment. That's, that's at the end of the day, the issue associated with it. Uh, so in some respects, the notion of whether it be uh, a quotas or standards based, if we're talking about salary levels of around 140,000, 180,000, is quite irrelevant because they're going to um, have a fit at the, the salary levels and the costs associated with that. Uh, the numbers, uh, are for reasons that are hard to explain, because if you look at the, the research report, the research report costs this in the context of schools being funded at a schooling resource standard which David Gonski and co in their first report said was the minimum amount of money that is required in the system to be able to deliver the goals of schooling contained in the, the Melbourne Declaration. So, you know, this is just the, the, the fundamentals associated with all this. Uh, Queensland currently... So federal government's capped its contribution at 20%. Uh, the Queensland Government, when it signed its bilateral agreement last year, uh, was at 69.28%. So schools in the Queensland state system overall are below 90% of the funds that are required to be able to deliver, according to the Gonski calculations, um, 
the deliver on the Melbourne Declaration goals of schooling. Now, if you had that 10%, add an extra 11% to the education budget in the state, there's ample room to be able to do the sorts of things that are necessary to make teaching more attractive um, as a profession. Mm. And, and sorry, I, sh I should say, this happens in context too. Uh, I look back on some of the uh, earlier things. Uh, I look back on a 1990 Schools Commission document called um, Australia's Teachers and Agenda for the Next Decade. Uh, and you, know, you can pick up a lot of the policy stuff and we still haven't tried it um, 30 years on. Uh, but one of the things that it said right at the start was placing it in context. We are not in a crisis in any of this. Uh, a lot of places around the world would just kill to have the professional teaching workforce that exists in Australia and in Queensland in particular. United States, UK, all those sorts of places would like to have people as skilled and as qualified as we have in Queensland. So it's not a crisis in the, sen in the sense of a deficit, but it is a crisis in the sense of how much better could we be if we had the means to do it. Exactly, and I, I, I reiterate that. And I think that the point is that there has been a declining trend in the last sort of two to three decades. And I think the more that the disparities do open up in salaries, you sort of question well, where will that trend keep going? You know, these are very slow, gradual changes, but we are starting to really see some of the effects. Was the trend pinned to, say, was the trend pinned to um, uh, civil servant salaries in general, for instance? So you, you can see that um, the teaching salaries have largely flatlined. Has the bureaucracy also flatlined at the same level? So are we sort of captured by, um, uh, by public servants? Or, are, or do teachers appear to be, have been poorly represented relative to public servants? I'm not sure about public servants particularly, but... Um We've compared teacher pay to professional pay um, in a variety of careers across Australia. Um, I think in terms of the trends, so there has been... A big part of the explanation has been the move of a lot of bright women out of teaching as they gained um, options elsewhere. So that, that, was, that was a big chunk of the decline in the 80s. But we have seen um, more people move out in the last... Fewer high achievers selecting... To to go into teacher education courses in the last decade as well. Um, the declines have been the greatest of people going into teacher education in the last decade of all fields of, of education at a high level. Um, so undeniably there is, there is, some, there is some link there. Um, and there have been, we have looked at the pay increases in the last, I think it's over the last decade in different states and territories and how that's compared to pay increases in other professions and it, it has still not kept even kept up with the increases. So not only are we coming from a lower base, but the increases aren't <coughs> the same either. Yeah. Um, so, is, yeah. but but part of part of the premise of your question is correct because working in state systems, most state governments have a, a state wages policy that is the benchmark for everything that they do. Uh, so in Queensland, there's a there's a salary benchmark. In New South Wales, it's legislated by law that uh, the Industrial Relations Commission cannot arrive at a number that is higher than what the government policy is. Now, the ironies of life are that in both our last two enterprise bargaining agreements, we've achieved more than the government wages policy because we've played around with the scale and put steps. So. Paul was bemoaning the fact before that he had to do all that paperwork for a highly accomplished teacher and he'd, he'd get there through an extra step um, in a couple of years. Both times we've achieved more than that through restructuring the scale. But going back to the issue about marketing plans, the government insists on, on presenting the teacher enterprise bargaining deals as this is compliant with government wages policy and it's only 2.5% hmm. when it's not. So it undercuts its own hmm. 
capacity to recruit people into the profession. Yeah. Maybe just going back to your comment about what's the appetite for these salary increases, and we might just wind up because I'm conscious of time. Um, the, so my sense on that is that a big part with the, from the internal workings within government, treasuries are op, uh, obviously very reluctant to agree to any across the board sort of or, or, or higher rates of pay because exactly the problem that Graham described with the Advanced Teacher Skills Program where they agree to a high rate of pay and then suddenly everybody's on it and it's this automatic pay increase. And so I really think one of the key things holding the sector back has been not necessarily acknowledging differentiated roles for different people at different rates of pay. And that's a really cultural thing and I think actually the profession needs to stand up if they are going to get change. Um, and, you know, I think there are... There are um, I think we are moving in that direction gradually through some of the whole sort of schemes and programs. Yeah. Um, and, and if you look at sort of, sort of some of the hard-nosed people in Treasury and Finance, they're economists. They agree, like, you know, you need to have a steeper um, salary trajectory if you are to encourage people in terms of those trade-offs. So um, I would hope that there is more appetite there in this day and age. Um, but thank you for being such an engaged audience tonight. Um, I might wrap up on on that final comment. Um, and thank you so much. Please give me a hand in thanking our speakers. It's been fantastic. Great. And thanks so much for coming today.